How's everybody this morning? Thank you. I'm Fred Hines. I'm the president and CEO of Clarity Child Guidance Center. And it's my special privilege to welcome you to ClarityCon 2014, a summit on children's mental health. Ahead of you is a day and a half of informative and interactive presentations. Today, your keynote speaker will be Dr. Ellen Broughton, and we are so excited that she has flown in from Boston to join us. And those of us who are here and you know, know about the humidity and all that, she's been through a really long winter in Boston, so she was very, very happy to be here. We are pleased to welcome our special post-luncheon speaker, Kay Warren, who joins us from California. I suppose her weather's probably better than it is here to share her story in ministry. We look forward to hearing from Kay. Throughout the day, you will also have 15 breakout sessions to choose from, presented by some of our community's leading authorities on children's mental health. Tomorrow, we welcome Dr. Steve Pliska for a keynote address and what promises to be an engaging panel discussion on children's mental health and primary care providers. There will also be a choice of three breakout sessions for you to attend. It's going to be a full day and a half for you. Having this conference is important. There is a critical shortage of psychiatrists, and in particular, child and adolescent psychiatrists. Everyone across the nation is looking for solutions to provide care to the nearly 20% of children who will need our help. Creating and sustaining this conference is but one way we can share knowledge together and help heal young minds and hearts. As a result, we intend to make this an annual event and would appreciate your input on topics and your overall conference experience. We want to create a destination conference that is beneficial for anyone associated with children and adolescent mental health. I would also like to ask you to join me in thanking the over 20 speakers, presenters, and panelists who will be joining us today and tomorrow. There will be surveys following each session for you to complete, and we would appreciate your opinions. Please note, we will provide the CEU certificates after our final session tomorrow morning at 11.15 a.m. No sneaking out early. Last year, Clarity Child Guidance Center cared for nearly 8,000 children struggling with mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. And as many of you know, if we had the capacity, there were many more kids we could have served. Thankfully, other organizations in San Antonio are there to provide services, but it's still not enough. From beds to psychiatrists, our community has limited resources. I want to share with you for a second how Clarity Child Guidance Center is taking steps to address the gaps. In January of this year, we opened our first Clarity Child Guidance Clinic in the Westover Hills area on the west side of San Antonio. This clinic has already provided 859 therapy appointments, 633 psychiatry visits for over 200 children. We've also provided 200 days of care through a new unique prog let me try that again, a unique program uh, designated or designed to prevent hospitalization. It's called day treatment or partial hospitalization. That's our second partial hospital program. We are also preparing to break ground on a campus expansion that will add an additional 20 beds to our existing 52 bed hospital. When these additional beds become available next year, we will have created a regional psychiatric emergency service for children, with six of the new beds designated for psychiatric emergency services and observation. That's to prevent the nearly 1,300 children who annually visit a local ER only to discover that psychiatric care is not available or only available after hours of waiting in the ER. We continue to create awareness of the importance of children's mental health through our One in Five Minds advocacy campaign. We recently celebrated our first year anniversary of One in Five Minds, and to date, over 1,200 people have signed up to support increasing access to treatment for kids and their families struggling with mental illness. We appreciate the work you all do to care 
for the one in five kids who are struggling with a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. I trust you will find this next day and a half to be beneficial in increasing your awareness about topics and tools to support you as you work with your clients. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, a few important things to know about the conference. First, this is the Coronado Room. This is where you will hear the keynote speakers, have breakfast again tomorrow, hear from our post-lunch speaker, Kay Warren, today, and return for CEU certificates tomorrow after the last session ends. No sneaking out early. Second, there are exhibitors in the lobby next door. You will pass them on the way to your breakout sessions. We encourage you to visit with them and thank them for being here to support ClarityCon 2014. In your bag, you have an exhibitor card. For each booth you visit, you will receive a signature. Everyone able to get all signatures can turn in their card tomorrow when you pick up your CEUs. We'll draw from the cards for free entries to ClarityCon 2015. Third, breakout room names are outside the doors. While you have time in your schedule to visit exhibitors, we also ask that you arrive at the breakout sessions promptly. And last, but certainly not least, would you please join me to thank our presenting and luncheon sponsors. A special thank you to tomorrow's keynote, sp keynote sponsor, Bear County. Thank you to our Kay Warren luncheon sponsor today, Community Bible Church. And thank you to the sponsor of this morning's keynote, pre keynote presentation, Methodist Healthcare Ministries, and to NowCast for streaming the conference live. I'd like to now bring your keynote speaker to the podium. Dr. Ellen Broughton is a renowned psychologist, researcher, television contributor, and author who works tirelessly in the field of pediatric neuropsychological and psychological assessment, particularly in the area of assessing learning disabilities and attentional disorders. Her career, ex her career expands. It expands from today on, right? Uh, her career <laughs> spans over 30 years with a PhD in counseling psychology from Colorado State University, a postdoctoral fellowship in child adult psychology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, a Master of Arts in clinical psychology from the University of Colorado, Denver, and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Wisconsin, all which establish her as a leading authority in pediatric neuropsychology. Dr. Broughton acts as both director of the Learning and Emotional Assessment Program at Massachusetts General Hospital and a professor of general child psychology at Harvard University. She specializes in pediatric neuropsychology and is a member of the American Psychological Association and the American Psychological Society. She has published research on multiple topics. Dr. Ellen Broughton is not only a psychologist, she's an activist and philanthropist and a mother of two, allowing her to relate to a wide variety of audiences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Broughton to the podium. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's really such an honor and a privilege for me to be here today um, in support of this wonderful, wonderful organization. Um, I should tell you to, um, a few little housekeeping details first, and I am going to try and keep some time available for questions. So if you have questions as I'm speaking, jot them down because I hopefully will have time to answer them at the end. And what I'd like to do today is to give you information that will not just educate you, but hopefully will get you to think maybe a little bit differently about the kids that you work with. And I should say that the topic of my presentation um, uh, was kind of broad. So when I sat down to sort of put together this talk, I thought, wow, I really gave myself a lot of leeway as to what to talk about today. And I started to think, well, where should I start? So I, I'm going to start by just giving you some facts. And I know one of your um, slogans is one in five children. But when we look at population over the lifespan, it's actually even mental illness and psychiatric and behavioral disorders over the lifespan are even more than one in five. It's one in four when we look at lifetime prevalences. Um, so it's a big problem. All of you know that already. But what's important to think about is that for half of the cases, throughout the lifespan, half of them start before the age of 14, meaning 
out of all the psychiatric and behavioral and emotional uh, disorders that we see over the lifespan, half of those cases started before a child was even 14, before they even got into high school. And as you probably know, there is um, the, the third leading cause of death among young people ages 20, uh, 10 to 24 is suicide. So this is a big problem. So as I was sitting there thinking, okay, what do I want to focus on given that this is a, these are huge issues to think about, I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on three different things. And all things that come out of either my own research or research in the clinics with the, where I work at Mass General and Harvard Medical School. So the three things I want to touch on today are first the role of shared risk factors, which I'll explain to you in a minute. And I want to focus on, in a couple of ways, um, executive functions, especially organization, and processing speed. I want to talk a little bit about resiliency and what that means um, for the kids that we work with. And then I want to talk a little bit about collaborative problem solving. So what do we do for the kids who have um, great risk, who aren't resilient? What are some ways of helping them and treating them? <clears throat> so first, let me just start by talking about what are the most co common types of problems that we see in kids. When we think about childhood disorders, we're really thinking about five broad categories. Specific learning disabilities, nonspecific learning disorders, developmental disorders, mood disorders and behavioral disorders. So when we talk about specific learning disorders, what we're really talking about are things like reading, math, written expression, a problem in a specific area of learning. Um, when we talk about nonspecific learning disorders, we're talking about those kind of disorders that aren't specific to a particular, uh, pr to a particular subject. So um, nonverbal learning disorder is, a, is one of those kinds of disorders where kids have trouble with just the nonverbal problem solving in real life situations. I also think of ADHD as a nonspecific learning disorder. A lot of people don't. It can also go under behavior disorders and should. But I sort of think of ADHD as, as a disorder that affects every area of learning. I mean, kids who have severe ADHD, they're impacted in reading and math and written expression and social studies and art and PE. So I kind of think of that as, as a more broad kind of category in terms of learning disorders. When we think of developmental disorders, that includes the category of autism spectrum, what we used to consider or call Asperger's, and mood disorders include things like depression and anxiety, Behavioral disorders, again, things like ADHD, but also conduct disorder, oppositional behaviors, those sorts of things. I want to just talk about two of these disorders that I just mentioned, just to kind of give you a little frame of reference what we're talking about, because these are the two most common things you will see in schools. The first one is ADHD, and you probably already know this, but ADHD is characterized by three different behaviors, impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity. And some kids will be more hyperactive impulsive. Some kids will be more inattentive. Most kids have a combination of the two. Now, ADHD surprisingly only affects 3 to 5% of the population when we look at population-based studies. That might, when I say surprising, because it sometimes might seem, if you're a teacher in a classroom, that it's way more than 5%. Um, but that really is, in the population, the uh, number of people who meet criteria for the disorder. And over half of the kids with ADHD qualify for what we call a comorbid diagnosis, meaning they don't just meet criteria for ADHD, they also meet criteria for a learning disability or anxiety or depression. And I think this idea of comorbidity is one to really think about very carefully, because I'm going to be bringing this up a number of times. Um, because most of the kids we see aren't just ADHD or aren't just anxious. Most of the kids we see are a combination of many things. So it's hard for us as if you're in the classroom or in a treatment setting to just think about a child in terms of that one diagnosis. It's much more complicated than that. Um, one other thing to just consider in, in terms of looking at how uh, significant ADHD is on the population in general is that when we look at, at um, prison studies, we find that depending on the study, 25 to 40 percent of people who are incarcerated have ADHD. So when you think about it, that's way more than the general population, a huge risk factor for people. The other uh, disorder that you'll see uh, most prevalently in schools and in uh, the general public is reading disability. Sometimes the term dyslexia is used interchangeably. They're, they're similar. But um, a reading disability is the most common and best studied of the learning disabilities. We know far more about reading disabilities and dyslexia than we do any other learning issue. 
And most of the kids you'll see who have a learning disability, 75 to 80 percent of them will be diagnosed with a reading disability. So even though kids have math disabilities and disorders of written expression, that, is only, that only accounts for about 20 to 25 percent of kids with learning disabilities. And depending on the, on the population studied, somewhere between 5 to 17 and even up to 20 percent of, of a population could have a reading disability. And you might ask, well, why does that vary? Well, it's because we know that this kind of disability is genetically transmitted. So depending on the population you're studying, it may be more inherited than others. So there are certain areas of the country, certain regions of the world where it's much more prevalent. When you kind of think about it, if you're a classroom teacher and you have 20 kids in your classroom, chances are you'll have at least two kids in your classroom that'll meet criteria for a reading disability. Now, in terms of my uh, clinic at the hospital, like um, Fred was saying, I direct a program called the Learning and Emotional Assessment Program, which we refer to as LEAP. And to give you a sense of the kinds of kids who are coming into hospital-based settings, very much we see a lot of kids with ADHD, a lot of kids with learning disabilities. Those are our two main kinds of diagnoses that we see. About a quarter of the kids we see have an autism spectrum disorder. Large proportion, 25% have an anxiety disorder, and others have mood disorders like depression. Um, now you may be looking at this and saying, well that adds up to a lot more than just 100%. Well that's because most of the kids we see, 57% of the kids we see, have more than one diagnosis. And again, when you're thinking about the kids that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, chances are about half of those kids, based on our studies, and our studies are very similar to others that have been done, most of those kids will meet criteria for more than one diagnosis. And in our sample, 25% meet criteria for three or more diagnoses. So again, we have to start thinking about kids in a much more complex way than, than we generally have in the past. One of the biggest challenges for parents of all of the, when I showed you that last slide, when we ask parents of all of those kids with all of those different sorts of diagnosis, diagnoses, what is their biggest challenge? What they will say is disruptive behavior problems. And uh, disruptive behavior problems can be things like lying, cheating, um, aggression, verbal aggression, physical ag aggression. Not surprisingly, that's something that parents are quite, quite troubled by. So at um, our clinic, about 31% rated their child as showing moderate or significant disruptive behaviors in daily life. Meaning that they're saying that, boy, my child in daily life, yeah, he may have ADHD or he may have a reading disability, but really what's getting me really upset is this disruptive behavior, these disruptive behavior problems. And it's because they have really broad reaching kinds of consequences. For instance, the biggest problem that we find are social and peer problems. So kids who have problems with significant disruptive behavior disorders have problems getting along with peers. I guess that isn't super surprising. They also have problems in daily living skills. They don't brush their teeth like they should. They don't make their bed. They can't get from one place to the next as we would expect them to be able to do. School problems are also common. That It actually might surprise you that it's only 47% of kids with these kinds of behavior problems have school problems. And what really surprised us when we looked at this study is only 10% reported problems with parents. So somehow even these kids who are having major behavioral issues somehow are getting along fairly well with their parents. But this is a really big and complex challenge for both the child and for the families. And what we're finding is that unidentified problems seem to be playing somewhat of a causal role in behavior problems. What I mean by that is when kids aren't diagnosed with a condition or, or it's not identified that they're struggling with anxiety or they're struggling with a learning disability, what we find is that that lack of a diagnosis, that lack of being able to pinpoint what's troubling that child may actually be causing the behavioral issues themselves. So in the kids that we see, um, the kids at LEAP that we see who presented with disruptive behavior disorders, many of them had anxiety, many of them had co-occurring uh, co depression or mood concerns, 20% had developmental disorders such as autism, a number of had uh, learning disabilities, and then almost 70% had ADHD. 
In many of these cases, these kids went, weren't diagnosed before they came to us. So what we're supposing and what we're hypothesizing is that in many of these cases, the actual, what caused the behavior problem was the underlying issues. And I'm going to talk at the, at the end a little bit about what we can do about that and how we can help kids with this. We also know, in addition to that, that certain kinds of cognitive deficits may increase a child's risk for disruptive behavior problems. So for example, if a child shows delays in language skills, they're going to have a greater probability of having disruptive behavior problems. I mean, that just makes sense. If you're not understanding what someone is saying, you're going to have trouble actually behaving in the way they're asking you to behave. A lot of them also had problems in pragmatics and social communication, meaning that um, they don't know the, the rules for communicating with others. Again, that if they can learn those rules for uh, knowing how to communicate with others, they may then not display as many behavior, uh, disruptive behavior disorders. Many of them showed problems in what we call set shifting, meaning they can't get from one activity to the next without problems. And a lot of them had problems with impulse control. So when we look at all of those diagnoses that I showed you and think about these disruptive behavior disorders, what we've learned is that there are problems that are common to all of these diagnoses. So um, it's not just about the diagnosis itself, but also about the skills that underline these, di uh, underlie these diagnoses. So things like executive function skills, language processing skills, emotion regulation skills, being able to think flexibly, for example, and to be able to be um, a social being, to be able to think socially. How am I supposed to act in this way? What is somebody else feeling? What is their experience like? And how can I change my behavior to match somebody else's experience? So one of the things we're thinking about in, in our research is not just looking at diagnoses themselves or disorders themselves, but looking at the underlying issues that are transmitted. And when I'm talking about risk factors, that's what I'm talking about, is what are the risk factors for a particular diagnoses? So we know, for example, that kids with ADHD have problems with uh, executive function skills. But what we're finding is, so do kids with anxiety disorders. Um, so it's, it may be, actually, that it's the uh, executive functions or these underlying, I'm just going to put this back here for one second, those underlying disorders that are, that are what's transmitted. So we're doing some genetic studies at our clinic, and they're fairly preliminary because you need a lot of, lot of kids, a lot of families to do really good genetic studies. But one of the things we're thinking about, and some of the new research that's coming out in our clinics and, and in other clinics, is that perhaps we've been looking in the wrong spot. So we've been looking at, for instance, finding a gene for depression or finding a gene for ADHD or for anxiety. And maybe that's not where we should be looking. So we have, in some cases, found markers or gene markers for things like autism and dyslexia. And that's, that's been great, and they've been very informative kind of studies. But really, when we look at it, for instance, some of the genes identified for autism, they explain like maybe 2 or 3% of all kids with autism. So what we're thinking about is maybe what we should be doing is looking neuropsychologically, looking at the underlying neuropsychological impairments that, that occur across these disorders. That perhaps that's what's transmitted. Perhaps it's, it's the underlying problem with organization or executive function. And in one person, it can come out as ADHD. In another child, it might look more like anxiety. And this is kind of a different way of thinking about kids thinking about them not as their disorder, but what the traits are, what the skills are that they have that underlie that disorder. Now, we know, for example, in one of the studies that was done in our clinic, that um, we, look at, we looked at families that had a child with ADHD. And we studied other people in the family, brothers, sisters, mom and dad. And what, we're, what we've found, and it's been quite robust in terms of our findings, what we found is that other family members who do not meet criteria for ADHD still have problems with executive function skills. So for example, Billy in the family who has ADHD has the impulsivity, the hyperactivity, the inattention. We test him. We can find that he's got problems with organization, with executive function, um, with processing speed. And then we, we look at a sister who's a good student, 
And we test her and we find that there are some subtle issues with her as well. So that's what's um, informing our thinking somewhat is that perhaps it's a gene that's transmitted that in some cases there's an environment and, and um, gene interaction that causes in one family member that gene to be expressed in the full-blown picture of the disorder. So that's kind of what this little um, uh, diagram sort of shows. So for instance, um, neuropsychological impairments we know are inheritable and may share some of their genetic etiology with the disorders in which they occur. So let me talk a little bit about executive function skills, and you guys probably already know a lot about this, but I thought I would mention it, and I want to talk about two executive function skills in particular that we are finding are something that seems to be inherited. Um, so just to get us all on the same page, so executive function skills, very general term, very hard to explain to parents, because it refers to a lot of different things. It refers to things like organizational skills, the ability to focus one's attention, as well as the ability to know where to focus one's attention, and the ability to maintain attention. And I also, I always have to put in there to know where to focus one's attention, because I hear all the time from parents, when they say, my child can't have ADHD, he plays video games all day long. And that really isn't good attention skills. They don't know where, that's, when it's not time to play video games, Billy still is playing video games. That's actually more a sign of ADHD than it is a sign not of ADHD. Um, and it's also the ability, of course, to inhibit one's behavior. So one of the things we assess in terms of looking at uh, kids with ADHD is we want to look at what's their focused attention like? How well do they in, encode information? How well does information get in there in a way so that they can make it meaningful? We want to look at working memory skills. And working memory isn't long-term memory. It's that short-term memory. It's our memory scratch pad that gets us thinking about, OK, somebody gave you a, a set of directions to do. Did you remember all three steps in the directions, or did you only remember the first one or only the last one? Kids with executive function problems have a tendency towards relatively weak working memory skills. We want to look at also organization and then processing speed. And, and I'm going to talk a lot about processing speed because it's, it's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. First of all, I don't know if you guys are finding this, but, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a second, but I'm, I've been finding that over the years, and I've been doing this for a long time, I didn't realize it was quite 30 years, it made me feel quite, <laughs> I was like, wow, that's a long time. Um, but it's true. And what I've found is that over the years, kids seem to be struggling more and more with just basic processing, meaning speed of processing. So, and those of you who are familiar with um, intelligence tests, one of the things that we measure on an IQ test, like the WISC, is processing speed. And we look at verbal memory and nonverbal memory and working memory and then also processing speed. Over the years, especially in the last 10 years or so, I have found that kids seem to be struggling more and more with just the timing of having to do the particular task. So processing speed, for example, on an IQ test is really how fast you can check some, look at something and say, is that the same or different? Or how fast you can copy a code. Kids seem to be getting worse and worse at this. And so, uh, and the other problem is that our world is just getting faster and faster. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so I've also, I've already mentioned this somewhat, but I'll mention it again, that problems in executive functions are common to all of these di diagnoses, but the reasons for them might differ. So for example, let me give you um, ADHD and anxiety. We know that both um, disorders are associated with problems in executive function. A child with ADHD may look at a problem and not know where to start in it. So they may show disorganization because they don't even know where to start on the problem. And they may just plunge in or they may not even touch it because they don't know what to do. Um, or they may do some other kind, you know, you may ask them to solve a problem. It's kind of up to them on, as to how to do it. They may just start talking about something else. Whereas a child with anxiety will also show on tests problems with organizational skills, but their problems under, are, are underlied by problems with over attention to details. So they may look at a, a situation or a problem and, and focus on one particular detail. So they show problems with organization, but the, the actual reasons for them are different and the treatments for them would be different as well. And kids with mood disorders and autism spectrum disorders and learning disorders also have problems with executive functions for very different reasons. Kids with learning disabilities have problems perhaps reading what they're supposed to do in a certain problem. 
kids with autism spectrum may have problems because they don't actually get the social uh, organizational structure of a situation. And kids with mood disorders may just not have the energy to attack a particular problem. If you're depressed or um, you may just not be able to engage in the problem solving activity. So the reasons for the problems may differ and the techniques for dealing with them would, di would differ as well. So I'm going to give you a little test here. Just to, I want to just show you how we measure organizational um, uh, organization in kids with ADHD. And I'm, this is, comes from a test called the Hooper Visual Organization Test. And this test is a series of pictures. And we have the child look at this, or even adults look at this. This is even used for adults. And we say, OK, here's a picture and, uh, of a puzzle. And the pieces are all of the puzzle are all kind of cut up and placed around this page. Imagine what this would be if you put the puzzle pieces together. What would it be? So it helps them, or it helps us understand how are they looking at something that's kind of disorganized, just strewn around a page, and how do they then make meaning of it or make sense of it? Um, I won't put anybody on the spot, but does, does anybody know what it is? This one's a hard one. In fact, it's the hardest one on this test. That's why I put this one down. It's actually a shoe. Can you even imagine that it is? A shoe. I know with the lace, you see that thing at the very bottom there? That's kind of the lace. It's actually the, there are a lot of, of items on this test that are really easy that I could have put up and you'd be like, oh, I know exactly what that is. But um, this one actually, I had trouble seeing it. And what we did one time in the clinic is we actually made a copy of this and cut it out and pasted it together to actually believe, to see. And it does actually make a shoe. But it is hard to. So that's one way we measure. And there are many, many ways we can measure organizational skills. But I just want to give you a taste for this. The other thing is this. How many people have already seen this kind of figure? Yeah, OK. So this is one of our more sensitive tests for ADHD and just organization in general, because kids with ADHD tend to fail miserably on this test. So take a minute on this. In fact, even if you want to take a second or two to go ahead and just draw it out, um, what would it, where would you start? I'll give you a second or two if you. So it's called the complex figure. It's called the Ray Osterreich um, complex figure, and it, for a good reason, um, because it is complex. But I don't want to interrupt those of you who are actually trying to do this. But when you look at this, it's a, so a child with ADHD would look at this and say, oh my goodness, I don't even know where to start. A lot of them start over there on the very left-hand side with that cross, which is like the worst place to start. Kids with ADHD often start in the middle of the page with the little cross and then run out of room to actually finish the, the figure on the page. Um, if you look at this figure, though, one of the things you'll notice is if you start with the rectangle and put in the horizontal and diagonal lines, it all kind of falls into place. So people with good organizational skills will approach it that way. Most of the kids I see do not. So let me show you what a good, a well-organized figure will look like. For those of you who are still drawing and want to. So um, oftentimes I have kids and people who administer this test have kids and adults even do this test using different colored markers so we can see how they approach the test. Not just did they get it all right, but what was the order in which they did this. So for example, this one I started with the, the black color. So this person, very well organized, knew exactly how to attack this problem. Started with the big rectangle, see written in the black. They put the horizontal and diagonal lines in. And then, boom, everything else kind of falls into place. Then they went to the red, to the outside. Then they put in um, some of the blue and then finished up with the green. So it's actually a perfectly drawn figure because they started with the, the rectangle. Now, take a look at this one. This is a kid, a very, very bright kid with ADHD who it doesn't look that bad. So I show this to parents. And oftentimes, I'll show this particular test to parents. And they'll be like, you, you gave my child that test? I can't do that. That's really, you know. But, um, and I showed this to the parents, and they're like, that's not bad at all. But when you look at this, do you see how poorly organized it is? Do you see how this person started with, um, actually started with the purple? So they started over there with that purple cross, went around, did the bottom, 
Then they came around to the blue and started around there. And they, there isn't even a rectangle embedded in this. So a lot of times when I talk to parents about, all right, your child is struggling with organization, here's, here's proof, here's some in living color that they don't see, they don't make sense of the world in the same way we do. They, they don't see that rectangle. Um, they kind of just sort of just start and hope that they reach the solution at the end. So it's not really a perfectly drawn figure, it's very compartmentalized. When I was talking before about kids with anxiety disorders, Oftentimes, kids with anxiety disorders do very poorly on this test for a different reason, like I was saying. So kids with ADHD tend to plunge into a test like this and, ah, let me just give this a try, and then they may or may not come out with the right um, kind of solution. People with anxiety disorders tend to overfocus on the details. They tend to worry about, oh my gosh, there are all these little details. So they'll be disorder. Their figures will look similar, but again, it's for a different reason. They'll kind of overfocus on all these little details, really being anxious about, will I get all these parts right? Now here's a really bad uh, ray. This child um, was quite ADHD, also had some other issues, but you can see that for this child, Organizational skills are just not where they need to be. And I think this was a 10-year-old. Um, and so this child just doesn't even see the world in the same sort of way that we might be expecting him or her to. And it's a child with normal intelligence, too. They just could not do this task at all. That just gives you a sense for organizational skills. And again, we're finding these sorts of skills are ones that tend to run in families. Now the other thing, like I was saying, <clears throat> that I'm very interested in looking at is processing speed. <clears throat> and I should tell you too that I'm, I just finished writing a book that's coming out on processing speed called Bright Kids Who Can't Keep Up. And the reason, there are two reasons why I, this uh, subject is near and dear to my heart. One is because, like I said before, I'm seeing more and more kids who are struggling with this issue. I also have to say too that I'm a, I'm a mother and I have a son who's 20 now who has ADHD, more the inattentive subtype ADD, um, and he struggles a lot with processing speed. So I was seeing this all day long in the clinic, kids who are struggling to get their work done, teachers who are complaining, you know, this child can never get anything done, and then I'd go home and do homework. I thought, so when my um, editor of my uh, last book said, you know, what's the next thing you want to write about? Should it be working memory? Should she came up with all these different ideas? I'm like, processing speed. So it's, I just think it's one of those things that tends to give parents and teachers the most trouble in day-to-day -day life. So anyway, so what is processing speed? So processing speed is the speed at which we can perform basic cognitive operations. It includes a lot of different things. How quickly we perceive information, how we can um, allocate our attention. This is what I need to pay attention to. This is how quickly I can move to that. It includes our ability to kind of chunk information. So when we look at something and um, we're trying to process it, can we kind of chunk it into information so it gets into our brain? Um, it includes things like our long-term memory access, so how quickly we can access information in long-term memory, retrieve it, how quickly we can respond correctly to a, a, a question. Um, and then also how quickly, again, we can uh, access our long-term memory storage. So I don't know if this is something that you guys seem to uh, struggle with a lot, but I do hear from teachers that this seems to be, that, you know, this child can never get anything done. A lot of times that's the main referral question, is not he's struggling with reading or he's, he's not paying attention, but he's the last one done and I don't know how to help this kid. Um, I also get questions a lot from parents about what this is, and it's really hard. Even I just wrote a book on this, it's still really hard for me to explain. And in part because we, there's no single brain region that's been identified as what causes processing speed. So it's really a more complex kind of problem that, um, that uses multiple regions of the brain. So again, um, processing speed, it's basically how long it takes someone to get something done in a certain period of time. And it's always been thought of as an executive function skill. It still is thought of as an executive function skill. And again, these skills are things like goal setting, planning, prioritizing, but I kind of think of processing speed as maybe a little bit different. Maybe it's something that actually underlies our executive function skills. So for example, if Executive function is the car, processing speed is the engine. 
So again, looking at some of these issues like goal setting, planning, organizing, if we don't have a good engine, it's hard to get moving on any of those other kinds of issues or problems. So for example, having a faster engine or a more powerful engine means the car can go faster. So good executive functioning depends on the quality of the engine. So if we've got a more efficient engine, it allows our car to function at a higher level of efficiency. So now, I don't really know that much about cars. I had somebody ask me one time, does that mean that it's like the horsepower of the engine or the torque? I don't really know. <laughs> but it is something that it does seem to, to um, you know, like if we have a better engine, it doesn't really matter what the car, what the outside of the car is like, we can still move quickly. So the other issue, and I think I've alluded to this earlier, is that processing speed is becoming so much more important in our fast-paced world. So we kids just have so much more to take care of, so much more to worry about, so much more to do. And the, uh, the requirements of their time are vast. So when we're talking about things like processing speed and thinking about a child maybe in the classroom or in a clinic who's just not quite getting it quickly enough, it can actually encompass a lot of different things. And not everybody has problems in each one of these areas, but most have problems in more than one. So the three major issues that we're talking about when we're talking about processing speed are visual processing, verbal processing, and motor speed. So visual processing can, can be just as simple as how quickly our eyes perceive information and relay it to the brain, how quickly our eyes dilate to light. Now we know that people who have problems in visual processing have problems in these areas. Um, people with slower visual processing have more car accidents. They have more difficulty looking up phone numbers. They have difficulty making change in an in a interaction. And they have diff difficulty finding something on a shelf. Now these studies that I'm um, referring to have all been done with elderly people who are losing their executive functions, who are slowing down. And so when you think about it, that makes sense. Like if grandma or great grandma is having trouble, she's slowing down, she's having trouble finding a phone number, she's having trouble making change. We give grandma plenty of time and leeway to do that because we kind of understand, well, she's just slower than average. She's older, she's slowing down. We don't always accord the same kind of time to kids who have problems in this area. What we tend to do is to say, speed it up, hurry up, what's taking you so long? So we need to kind of think about kids who, who fall on this lower end of the spectrum on processing speed as kind of being more like grandma who's having more trouble. You know, we need to give them more time to be able to process these sorts of things. Also, when you think about car accidents where there are some studies being done at the hospital, I'm not doing them, looking at ADHD and car accidents and, and reaction times, and we might be finding out that, that kids also who have trouble with processing speed have more car accidents. We know that kids with ADHD who go untreated have more car accidents. So this might be, it's not a reason to not give these kids licenses, but it might be a reason for us to intervene. Verbal processing is how quickly we can hear something and then react to it. It includes things like making meaning from what someone has said and then reacting to it. So you think about these kids in the classroom, it means the teacher's asking a question and they're not the first ones with their hands up. In fact, they're still thinking about the last question by the time the next question's already been answered. In a um, setting like in a therapy session, they may be the kind of child who just doesn't quite process the information, the questions that the therapist might be giving them um, quickly enough. Uh, this is linked to when we look at studies done again on adults, because we don't really have any studies on processing speed in kids yet. Um, it's linked to problems with nearly all aspects of verbal memory and comprehending instructions. So we think it's linked to verbal memory because the longer it takes somebody to process information, the more likely it is they're losing that information. So it's not getting into verbal memory as quickly as it should because they're not encoding it quickly enough. And the other thing that includes, that processing speed includes, is just kind of simple motor speed. Placing pegs in a board, copying a, uh, a series of numbers, and even being able to just read a paragraph, which includes, again, when you think about it, visual processing, verbal processing as well. A lot of the tasks that we do to, to measure processing speed include multiple areas. 
It doesn't, I should say, though, in terms of motor speed, we're not finding that these kids are necessarily slower on the soccer field. That this doesn't tend to, uh, we, we, at least we're not finding it yet, this doesn't tend to, to go into sort of gross motor skills. And it may be that the, the way that kids participate in gross motor skills are very, you know, it's kind of one thing. It's either the hockey and the, uh, on the hockey puck or the, um, the soccer ball. So it, it actually, sports may, be a good thing for some of these kids because they only have one thing to keep track of. So that may be why we don't necessarily find problems in processing gross motor processing speed in kids who have fine motor processing speed. So basically, it's complicated. What we're, when we're thinking about processing speed, we're thinking about things like being able to scan for the right kind of detail, understanding visual sim, uh, symbols, being able to do something in the right order, being able to quickly learn a routine, being able to work quickly, methodically, know where to start. Think back to that design that I showed you, the Ray Osterite. So a child with slow processing speed may just kind of look at that for you know, longer than they should, and again, not know where to start, and it takes them longer. They don't understand kind of uh, the underlying visual uh, organizational structure of the task, and can't then work quickly and methodically. So when you think about the kinds of tasks that kids are asked to do in the classroom, a lot of them are complicated. A lot of them involve understanding detailed visual symbols, even something as simple as copying notes from a board, um, being able to scan and know what it is that I'm supposed to write down, or what is it that the teacher's saying that's important. They're slower at being able to kind of sort through what the teacher is saying. So I'm going to just talk a little bit, just in case you guys are curious, about how this processing speed actually happens in the brain. So um, a faster nervous system allows for us to more rapidly process information. So, and this may take you back, especially if I show you this next slide, to um, high school biology, and if it brings back bad memories, I, I, uh, I apologize, but basically, uh, because, and again, because people ask, like, well, what causes somebody to be slower? Because, again, you look at these kids and you think, if they just would try harder, they would do better. Um, again, to kind of talking about my own home life, sometimes I would just say to my son, just start by picking up the pencil. But even that takes a long time. Well, I don't know which pencil to pick up and I don't know where to, like, so it's, it's just, they're just lowered everything. And really, it's, it looks so much, and I, I I find that dads have even the hardest time with this. I shouldn't stereotype like that, but dads tend to be more like, if you just get it done, he just has to do it. But really, they are just slower at this, and it's, it happens in the brain. So a lot of different things can uh, cause this. One is just how big the nerves are in the brain. And another thing is the myelin sheathing. So um, let me just show you this for a minute. So basically, Nerve diameter can play a part in this. Some kids just have smaller nerve cells that may cause them to be slower. There's also a coding, and I don't know if, um, again, this might take you back to high school, college biology, but there's a coding that runs along the axon that carries the impulses from one brain cell to the next. And that's called the myelin sheath or the myelin coding. And as kids grow, that coding develops over time. That's why kids' executive functions improve over time, because that gets better over time. For these kids, what we're thinking is maybe some of them have that, a poor coding in that area of the, of the cell. And one of the reasons why we think that might be true is we know that in certain um, syndromes such as multiple sclerosis, part of the syndrome is that their, that myelin sheet starts to break down. Well, what happens when, for those people that coding starts to break down, they start to slow down. They're, it's associated with other things too, like numbness and inability to walk, but, but one of the major things we find in MS is that people start to become slower. It slows the whole process down. Um, and so that's one uh, of the hypotheses as well. And then the other thing is, is just how efficient, and I don't have a pointer here, but just how efficient the two cells communicate with one another. And we're looking at this because we don't have any medications that actually address this. We don't have anything that, that can speed up the brain's processes. So we, you know, we have some medications like Adderall and Concerta and Ritalin. They don't really 
um, make a big effect in terms of how quickly the brain processes information. Now it does help with attention. And so we find that the more attentive kids are, the better and quicker they are. We always are. If we know how we're going to proceed in a task, we can do the task quicker. So in some of the ways that we're um, proposing that kids can speed up organization, teaching them good executive function skills and those sorts of things can definitely help. But we want to look actually at what happens in the brain so we can find treatments that actually might speed up that area of the brain. We're still not there yet, not really even close, but that's where, that's where the research is going now. So um, one of the things to consider is what kind of, what these kids look like, what kids with slow processing speed tend to look like. And we thought, I thought originally that most of these kids were just kids with ADHD because, you know, when you think about the attentive kid in the classroom or in the uh, home setting, they're the child who's just like, huh, what? But what we found is that not, this is, it's not synonymous, it's, it's not the same. Um, kids with ADHD, so these, in, in terms of our studies, kids with ADHD, um, so the percentage of kids with slow processing speed who met criteria for ADHD was only 61%. So um, not every child with slow processing speed has ADHD, nor does it work the other way. When you look at this, a lot of kids with reading disabilities have slow processing speed, a fair number of kids with generalized anxiety disorders, um, math disorders, bipolar disorder, depression. So it's something to consider. You know, a fair number of kids in a lot of these issues have this particular problem. So it's something to consider when you're working with kids is what's the tempo of this child? What's their normal rate of being? And when you're thinking about ADHD kids, that's definitely, chances are better than average that they're going to have this problem. But even when you're looking at kids with reading disorders and um, anxiety disorders, one out of five, one out of four will have trouble in this. And it's a big problem. It's really something that has to be looked at in terms of treatment. So in our clinic, just to describe what these kids look like, um, we studied kids from ages 10, um, I mean, excuse me, 2 to 20, and the average was about 10. And um, what we found is that they tend to, this, this kind of problem with slow processing speed tends to be more prevalent in boys. And you know, that might surprise you or it might not. I mean, we do know that almost every disorder we study is more prevalent in boys, with the exception of depression. Um, so that may just be, that's just one of those things that boys just tend to have more um, diagnosable problems. It may also, though, be because boys are just slower at fine motor tasks. And a lot of the way that we measure processing speed um, is with fine motor tasks, writing. Um, there also may be somewhat of a gender bias in teaching that may cause boys to be a little bit less, uh, to, may cause boys to practice these kinds of skills a little bit less. You know, we tend to, you know, if a boy has poor handwriting, it's like, ah, oh, he's a boy, don't worry about it. But that may actually be affecting um, how they're performing on these kinds of tasks. These kids also, very interestingly, have problems with social difficulties. They have major problems with language impairments. So a child with slow processing speed, chances are very strong that they have some subtle language problems. Not just problems comprehending, they may have even very decent problem, or very decent performance on, like for instance, the WISC test, um, looking at verbal intellect. But they may have problems with, for instance, retrieving information from memory. So they have these subtle language impairments. Um, a third of them had had delays in motor development in early childhood. So when we see kids very early who have delays in motor development, uh, it can be chances, you know, one out of three that they're going to also exhibit slow processing speed later on. The vast majority were on some kind of educational program, IEP, and again, it's not the same thing as ADHD. So the kinds of problems that we see in processing speed deficits are things like an inefficient use of time, underestimating the amount of work and time needed to complete tasks. So this is something that I see all the time. What's so ironic is that kids who have the slow processing speed tend to think that it's going to take them a shorter amount of time to get things done. So they, they look at a problem and they're like, I've got that nailed. I don't need to get started on that. That's only going to take me 30 minutes. When really, if it takes the, re the rest of the class an hour, it's probably going to take them 90 minutes to do it. But somehow, they think that they're going to get done quicker. Um, I, and I just find this, I, I, this to be universal. Um, of course, slow work pace or failing to pace one's work 
um, not being able to evaluate good strategies that would help them. So you give them a strategy, you know it's actually going to benefit them, and they're like, nah, I don't think that's going to work because I either, you know, they think they've already got it done or that uh, they just don't think it's going to work. So these kids really need to be proven to. You really need to take them through step by step as to how it will help them because most of the time they'll look at it and say it's not, it's not needed or it's not going to work. And they have very limited awareness of, of problem solving and organizational strategies so it kind of goes along with that idea that they can't evaluate really good strategies. Now in looking at these kids, the one other thing I want to think about um, is the role of resilience. And I think it's important to look at this because this is a big kind of strategy when we're thinking about how to help these kids, not just kids with slow processing speed, but all of those kids that I was kind of talking about. Resilience is one of the things we're finding is, is probably one of the biggest ways of, uh, fostering resilience is one of the biggest ways of actually fostering better performance, better outcomes. So resilience is, is that ability for somebody to maintain personal and social stability despite adversity. One thing to remember uh, is that resilience is a process, it's not a trait. We tend to think of it in our culture as something, well, there's a resilient person, there's a non-resilient person, and so you know, that's why that person did so well, that's why you know, she had a terrible life, but she wound up doing so well. But it's really not the case. Yes, we're all born with certain personality characteristics that might make us more apt to be more resilient, but it's really something that can be taught. So we need to kind of think about preventative measures and also corrective measures. So some of the elements of resilience are our biology, like I alluded to, that some, you know, sometimes we're just a little bit more better able to handle adversity, but also issues in the family and the social environment. One of the key features is attachment. That happens first, of course, in the family, but also attachment to schools and communities and churches. Also another big uh, important factor in resilience and awareness. And I think that's something to really think about when we're thinking about, okay, how do we look at kids? How do we identify their problem areas? How do we make that part of their awareness of themselves and their own ability to self-reflect? So you know, of course, that kids today are faced with a lot of different challenges that just makes this whole idea of resiliency even tougher. So there, the family is changing, they're exposed to more violence, at least more violence in the media. They see every week it seems like there's another school shooting. It's stressful for them. Um, availability of drugs and alcohol, and let's not even get into social media, the kinds of issues that that brings up for kids, especially kids who may have poor judgment or um, maybe more impulsive or more apt to act out. So it's much more difficult for them than it was, than it was for kids 20 years ago, most definitely. And the risks are more debilitating and have bigger consequences for kids with learning disabilities. Again, they don't always see what the consequences are of their actions. So risk factors are things that are associated with an increased likelihood that someone's going to develop an emotional or behavior disorder. And risk factors can be individual or they can be environmental. So one of the things to think about when we're talking about risk factors, and it kind of seems like a circular sort of statement, but kids with learning disabilities, just the learning disability in, in and of itself places them at, at risk for more emotional problems, more social problems. So um, already kids with learning disabilities, kids with behavioral challenges are already at greater risk for having more challenges for not being as resilient. Yet there are some ways we can protect these kids. And again, that protect them in terms of building resiliency. So that ability to spring back from adversity. And for kids with these sorts of issues that we're talking about, their adversity may be their disorder themselves. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they experience trauma or a difficult upbringing, although a lot of the kids we see have both. So the kinds of things, the protective factors are things like a good temperament, social competence, so kids are just born more social are more protected in terms of what life's going to throw at them. Family factors like supportive families, uh, families who set consistent kinds of rules, and community factors like supportive school environments, um, community, church, positive relationships with significant adults. 
And that's a, a very important kind of thing. Um, and I'll come back to that positive relationships with uh, significant adults in a minute. But I want to talk about this issue of self-awareness as a protective factor. So I talked a lot about, okay, there, here's our, here are some of the things we can identify that across disorders kids tend to struggle with. And it's always a good thing for kids to know after a certain age, depending on their level of understanding, what it is they're struggling with. It oftentimes can be very helpful for kids, very comforting for them to hear that you have ADHD. So why you're struggling is because of this, and this is, you know, it has a name. That can be very helpful for kids. But going further than that, it can be really helpful to know, well, what does that mean for them? that not every child with ADHD is the same. Not every kid with high-functioning autism is the same. In fact, the, the, the statement that we often use is when you've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism, that everyone is so different. Um, so uh, allowing, uh, excuse me, giving kids more self-awareness allows them to develop these sort of compensatory strategies, proactive strategies for achieving in school, as well as for finding employment. So kids who have better self-awareness are more likely to seek assistance when needed. They're more likely to avail themselves of the kinds of educational and employment opportunities that build on their strengths, and they also enter these kinds of opportunities knowing their weaknesses. So a lot of times parents will say to me, I don't want my child to know they have such and such, or don't tell him that he struggles with working memory skills, for example. But really, the research shows the opposite effect, that the more we can teach kids about who they are, the better able they are to be resilient and to be successful. Um, so in order to do that, one of the things that we found is, is most successful is to have early identification with educational, psychoeducational testing, neuropsychological testing that leads them to be able to adapt better. That provides a roadmap for the child, for the family, and for the teacher. And so, it, because it has a significant impact on functioning and also self-concept and self-esteem. So again, a lot of parents think like, if you tell my child too much about his profile, he's going to feel bad about himself. But really, the opposite tends to be true. It tends to increase self-esteem if it can be done in a way that's very, um, you know, well, here, here are your struggles. Here's how we're going to fix them. Here are your strengths. Those are the things to rely on. Um, and along with these kind of factors, being able to provide intensive early remediation. I know you all know that already. And also the other important environmental factor is being able to provide good and effective transition plans during high school. Um, and that's something that's mandated by law. I don't find that we do a particularly great job of it in Massachusetts. I don't know how you feel here, but it's really hard to put good, effective transition plans for high school students into place. I think it's just an area that we don't know a lot about, and I feel like that whole area of, of kids between the ages of like 18 and 24 is sort of that black hole, that tr what we call transitional age youth, is really just that, you know, that difficult area that we just don't really always know how to treat and how to get them successfully into adulthood. And a lot of parents will say, even the parents of kids who don't have problems will say they're having their tr trouble getting their child launched into adulthood. I think it's just a problem that we're having. So anyway, in terms of also rebuild, building resiliency, so one, one area is to get kids to know more about themselves, to understand them better, to look at some of these subtle executive function issues um, so that they know more about what is their own profile. But the other thing that's been very well documented is the impact of a single adult. So all it takes is one person in school. So if we look at people who have overcome adversity and ask them in adulthood, what was, what was the thing that got you through? The most frequent thing they'll say is the impact of one single adult. It just takes one person to make a difference. And it can be a minister, it can be a teacher, it can be somebody in their art class, but that person believed in them. And you know, we all can act as that single adult in a child's life. So the person who says, instead of if you only tried harder and put in more effort, you would do better, instead being the person who says, I know you're trying, but I think the problem may be that the strategies you're using or the strategies your teachers are using aren't the best strategies for you at this particular time. And that doesn't get the child off the hook. That doesn't mean that, well, then you don't have to do anything. It's like, we need to reassess here and figure out what's going to work for you. And that actually helps a child realize, well, it's not just me. So if a child 
having trouble learning to read and need a diff needs a different approach, it can be very comforting for them to know, oh, that's what it is. I just need to have a different way of learning or a different kind of setting. Um, the other thing that really builds resiliency is finding an area of competence. So taking pleasure in, in activities that um, they can find comfort in when things aren't going so well. Uh, this kind of goes along with what I just said, providing ample opportunities to assume responsibilities um, that make a contribution to the home because it provides them with concrete proof that they can be successful. So even the child who struggles paying attention in the classroom might be great in our class or they may be great in community activities. So that's, that part of their uh, experience is proof to them that, wait a minute, the world's a bigger place and I can be successful in certain spots. And again, being able to give, it also gives them these opportunities to learn skills for making better choices, making better decisions. So one of the things to remember is that the essential ingredient of high self-esteem isn't just saying, I'm really good at a lot of stuff. It's being able to believe that you have control over your environment, being able to believe that, okay, what I do makes a difference. What I, my environment, I can change what's happening. Not everything, but I can change, I can affect change on myself and I can affect change in the world I live in. And we tend to sometimes, not we necessarily, but our society tends to think of high self-esteem just comes from, you did a great job, you're great, you're great. With these kids, they know they're not great. They know, they can see this, that wait a minute, I'm struggling. What do you mean everything's great? Because it's not but providing them with opportunities that they can feel self-sufficient and feel like they can make a change in themselves or others is what is that missing ingredient for them. One of the most exciting things to think about when we look at kids with learning disabilities and behavioral challenges over the lifespan, if we can get them to college, the evidence for these kids is really remarkable. Meaning that when they get to college, there is, they're shown to be more resilient than college students who don't have learning disabilities. So for example, studies have shown that kids with learning disabilities report higher levels of initiative in everyday problem solving, better need for achievement. So that might be surprising to you that these kids are more resilient than others in college. Now you might say, well, that could be because you're only looking at the kids with learning disabilities who made it to college, and that is true. But when you think about the kids who have the deck stacked against them from the beginning, the fact that once they get into college, they look better, they look more resilient, um, that's an important fact to remember. So that's our, you know, kind of thinking about the long goal is that we're really thinking about launching these kids into college settings. So we don't really know, so we don't really know why this is, but we do know that, um, non-learning disabled college students report greater feelings of stress than kids with learning disabilities. And this is particularly true for kids who know about their learning disabilities who can advocate for themselves. So we, we're thinking that it could be because the protective mechanism of resilience counteracts the level of stress in learning disabled kids. And because kids with learning disabilities and behavioral challenges face more challenges, they develop better resiliency. So I tell this to parents a lot. So parents will say, you know, they've got the perfect child and then they've got their kid who comes to see me with ADHD and a learning disability. And I say to them, you know, if we can get this child into college, yeah, that child may actually be the more resilient one. And I see this all the time in my work at, at um, the hospitals. I'm, I'm oftentimes, very frequently, uh, hiring people for research assistants um, right out of college from the best colleges all around the country. They're great workers, they can do a great job, but what happens when the first time a parent gets mad at them on the phone because they're trying to schedule an appointment for an assessment or they're working with a child, a lot of times what I find is these great, great students crumble. They don't know what to do when a supervisor says, you know, the way you did that wasn't quite the way it needs to be done. They think it's, it's the most horrible thing to hear because they've never really heard that. Whereas kids with these kinds of challenges, if we can get them successfully to adulthood, they make great employees because they know life's filled with challenges. Life's not easy, I know that, and they keep plodding on. So it's, it's interesting to, to think about and I see it all the time in my own daily life. Now, I just want to mention, I think I have um, maybe 10 more minutes, five or 10 more minutes, and I'll take some time for questions again. I want to 
mention um, at least one sort of cutting edge treatment program for these kids who are not as resilient or who are more treatment resistant or who we have more difficulty reaching. And I want to talk about the role of collaborative problem solving or CPS. And this um, problem solving kind of program is done through a program at Mass General Hospital called Think Kids. And if you guys are interested in hearing more about this, for those of you who don't, may not already know about it, if you went, go online and, and look up Think Kids, you'll find more about this. They have great information. But I just want to kind of whet your appetite because I think that this is a nice sort of framework to, to think about interacting with kids on a daily basis who have these kinds of challenges. So the philosophy behind collaborative problem solving is thinking about kids do well if they can, not if they want to. And it is sort of an unconventional kind of way of thinking about kids is that, and I know again, as I have no trouble putting this into practice in, in work, but in my daily life sometimes it's hard as a parent to remember this. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I was a classroom teacher when I first graduated from college and I was a special ed teacher. And so I know what it's like to sort of be in there day in and day out, like dealing with kids from, you know, eight to three. And it's hard to remember that kids will do well if they can, if they know how to do well, not necessarily if they want to. So let me just talk for a second about this in terms of the conventional wisdom. Um, the reason why I put this picture of this drowning person is kind of think about people at the beach. And there are 10 people swimming, nine of them know how to swim, one of them does not. Who's trying the hardest to swim here? It's the person who doesn't know how to swim. And so it doesn't matter how much, if that child doesn't know how to swim or that person doesn't know how to swim, it doesn't matter how many times I say, just try harder, keep trying, keep going, get faster, they're not going to swim. They just aren't. Even reinforcement isn't going to work for this person. It's like, swim and then I'll give you a treat after you, learn, after you do this. It's not going to work for them. Neither is punishment. They just don't know how to do it. So the kids that I've been talking about are kids like this. They're the one in 10 or two in 10 who don't know how to swim. And so this kind of collaborative problem solving sort of turns con conventional wisdom um, on its head a little bit. That challenging kids, those most challenging kids that we see, lack skill, not will. And again, kind of thinking about those executive function skills, oftentimes those are the underlying skills that we're seeing that are problematic for these kids. Problems with flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, and problem solving skills. So kids who can't figure out a solution to a problem are going to look like they're having behavior problems not necessarily because they're just wanting to act out, but because they don't know what exactly to do. The other thing that we need to think about, just like building resiliency, these kinds of skills can be taught and developed. So there are kids who just are not as good at executive functioning as others, but we can teach these skills. It's a long process. And I think that's one of the hardest things for parents to remember is that these are not skills that are taught this year. They're not going to be taught in third grade and they're not going to be taught in eighth grade, but they're skills that we need to develop over the course of the lifespan really, but definitely throughout childhood and young adulthood. So the research that has looked at these challenging behaviors has shown that there are five different areas that are problematic for these kinds of most challenging kids. Again, looking across disorders. Um, and there are five different areas. One is the executive function skills that I've mentioned, language processing skills. So kids who just don't process language as well, who just have language disorders, have um, more behave, this kind of disruptive behavior disorders, problems with emotion regulation, problems with cognitive flexibility, and problems with social thinking. So we kind of pulled out, when we looked at the research, we're, when we we're looking at cognitive flexibility, that was such a big area. I know it's also considered part of executive function skills, but it was such a big area um, that we actually pulled that out in terms of looking at the, at the research on these skills deficits. These are the kids, when you kind of think about where they have a big problem, it's when going from one activity to the next, or even within a problem on a worksheet, going from one kind of problem to the next. That's a, that flexibility is really tough. 
So these kinds of skills, and the, the Think Kids model looks at the, the fact that these skills are best taught naturalistically in a relational context. So these kinds of skills aren't something that necessarily lend themselves to a course in executive functioning. You know, there's a place for that too, but not necessarily. These are something that needs to happen in the here and now. So again, let me just, I'm just gonna whet your appetite for this. Um, but basically, this kind of unconventional thinking um, looks at three different kinds of plans or assumes that there presumes that there are three different kinds of plans. So any time that a child is giving you some kind of a problem, there are three there are basically only three things you can do. One is you can impose your, your will on them. You're going to do it, you're going to do it now, I don't care what you say. Um, sometimes that doesn't work, but that's that's an option. The other option is to solve the problem collaboratively, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And the other thing to do is to drop it. That's real, those are really your only three choices. Sometimes dropping it is the right thing to do. Sometimes it's sort of like, okay, this is a battle I'm not going to choose to fight right now, at least not right now. But um, the, solving the problem collaboratively is the area that can actually help kids learn these kinds of skills that they're um, deficient in. So, plan A, again, imposing your will, what are the goals that you achieve for that, for example? Well, you get your expectations meet, met. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, sometimes imposing your will, you can not even get that met, but, but let's just say it worked, that you get your expectations met. Plan C, dropping it, you reduce the challenging behavior. So the child is having a tantrum, or they're refusing to do something, you say, okay, you don't, you don't have to do it, all right, problem solved but not really because they didn't actually give you what you were asking them to do. This plan B, this idea about collaboratively problem solving hits all of these areas. You get your expectations met, you're reducing the challenging behavior, you're also helping them solve problems, build relationships, build skills. So what does this look like, this plan B? And again, I'm, I apologize for kind of rushing through this, but it, but it kind of gives you a way of thinking about this. So plan B involves three different things. Empathizing with a child, sharing your concerns, and collaborating. So for example, let's say a child is having trouble getting along on the playground and um, is being perhaps even somewhat of a bully on the playground. What, what you'd start with is to empathize actually with their concerns. Empathize with okay, I see your, and I don't mean like saying like, it's fine, I, I understand why you're doing this, but empathizing in a way to say, I see you're having trouble with Billy on the playground. Now you don't seem to have trouble with him in math class. What is it about the playground that seems to be causing you guys to have this conflict? Or seems to be making you act like this? So you're, and then you're going to clarify what the child's concern is. How do they see the problem? You're going to share your concerns and then you're going to brainstorm with the child about possible solutions. So, and it's much, this kind of plan is much more about thinking through a problem as opposed to feeling the problem. So for, we, we oftentimes spend a lot of time talking to kids, well, how did it make you feel when you did that? Or how did it make you feel when so-and-so did this? Or how does it make you feel when you don't get your homework done? That's important, but that's not actually helping them solve the problem. I mean, it's important to know how you feel about different things, but what we're trying to do with this kind of a uh, problem solving plan is to actually get them to generate solutions, to get them thinking about what the solutions, potential solutions are. And kids may come up with good solutions and they may not. And it's your job in this kind of um, problem solving approach to help them evaluate, well, what would happen if you did this? So let's say you tried this solution, what would happen? Now, What's really interesting is using this kind of approach is found to be very, very effective in a lot of different areas. So my colleagues at, at Mass General um, have done a number of different studies looking at inpatient, outpatient, residential, juvenile detention, and school um, settings. And what we found is that, for example, in inpatient un uh, units, using this kind of a problem-solving approach that kind of addresses the child's executive function skills and underlying problems with language and those sorts of things, that it reduced the number and duration of restrictive interventions, decreases restraints, seclusions, short holds, and, um, and I should say too that these, 
this kind of study was done really giving a lot of information to the people working in that inpatient unit. But with a lot of training in this kind of problem solving approach, they found that it's quite effective, even effective in staff turnover. So it, it not only helps the kids, it makes for happier employees because they can see that what they're doing is actually working. In outpatient settings, it's uh, associated with fewer disruptive behaviors in kids with ADHD, ODD, um, lower parent stress, and higher parent-child relationships. In um, residential settings, it's uh, very similar to inpatient settings, more restrictive, inter or fewer restrictive interventions, uh, less aggression, better participation in community uh, activities, and same thing in juvenile detention facilities, like even in, in jails, they've studied this kind of pro approach to problem solving. Um, more, uh, I should say, fewer staff injuries, fewer restrictive interventions. And in schools, it's associated with um, lower teacher stress, fewer discipline referrals, and again, fewer of those kind of restrictive interventions. So let me just kind of summarize here, and then I'll, I think, I'm on target for the, okay, to have some uh, time for questions. So let me just kind of pull all this together and looking ahead at where we need to start thinking about kids and where the research is going in kids is we need to look at each one of these kids very individually and look at how each one of these vulnerabilities and each one of these risk factors contribute to those kind of behavior problems that are most problematic for us on a day-to-day -day basis. So in terms of cognitive vulnerabilities, we need to look at what is this child's language or communication skills? What about their cognitive rigidity? What role does that play? What about their executive function skills? Again, kind of thinking about that most of the kids we see, over half of the kids that we see tend to have more than one problem area. It's not just, we're not just looking at cognitive vulnerabilities, but also thinking more broadly what kind of emotional or risk factors do they have? Um, are they depressed? Are they anxious? What's their level of emotional insight? How does that play into this? How does that play into helping them strategize about their own kinds of behaviors? And then also looking more broadly. What are the ecological, the contextual factors that play into this? Their academic or school challenges. Again, all of these things interrelate. Um, their family and peer stressors. What kind of life events have they had? What kind of access to treatment do they have? Now we already know um, access to treatment is a tough, tough thing. It's, it's the same in Massachusetts. We have the highest rates of psychologists and psychiatrists and it's just as bad as what you had said is here. It's so hard to get kids treatment. So we have to kind of take that into account too. What's the access for a child's treatment? And then lastly, oops, I think, oh. I actually am missing a slide, but anyway, lastly, we also need to think about what the role of resilience plays into this and how we can actually make kids more resilient in order to um, treat and to help them interact in the world despite all of these kinds of cognitive vulnerabilities and these risk factors, both emotionally and contextually. So I'd like to just end there and would be happy to take any questions. I think that what um, you would need to do is to go to one of the mics if you feel comfortable enough doing that. Good morning. Hi. So I have an ill-formed question for you. Um, do you know of John Wrighty, the yes. psychiatrist yes. here? Yes, yep. So he talks about the impact of fitness, things uh -huh. like activity, nutrition, and so in your analogy or metaphor about the car engine, I was thinking they're not yes, all equal. Yes, that's a good point, yeah. Right? Some have a lot of gunk and they don't, they're not as efficient and they're yes. all of that. So I'm wondering if you could just touch on that briefly in terms both of in the moment, like today, how a kid is doing this morning who, you know, yes. has difficulties with those, and then also just uh, developmentally. Oh, that's a great, great question. So we know, well, first of all, let me talk about in the day. And one of the things, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because there are a million things I could bring up, but that the, what I always tell parents, because they'll say, well, what's, what's the, you know, should I change my child's diet? What about sugar? What? And I always tell them, we always feel better when we eat better, when we're well-nourished, when we're 
well rested. So overall, that is a very important um, factor overall. We know that um, exercise overall is associated with lower uh, rates of depression in both kids and in adults. In fact, in some studies, exercise is almost as good as antidepressants. So exercise is an important component of this that I um, didn't mention, but I'm glad you did. The other thing in terms of, and I didn't have time to talk as much, I'm going to talk in the breakout session a little bit more what to do with kids with kind of the slow um, cognitive tempo. But um, one of the things that we know helps these kinds of kids is frequent breaks throughout the day. So exercise is good overall in development, um, associated again with lower risks of depression and anxiety, but also within the school day, within the day, that one of the best things we can do to rev up somebody's engine is to give them a chance to kind of rev it up. So that means more frequent recess periods, more frequent times for them to actually charge their batteries. So when you think about it, when we're kind of sluggish anyway, what helps us kind of get moving is to get moving. And what has happened over the last whatever years, um, you know, we've cut out recess. We have cut out the ability for kids to move around as much because we have lots of requirements and lots of things that we have to do within the classroom setting which may actually be a reason why we're seeing more of these kids over time is that this tends to be a bigger problem because they don't have time to kind of rev up that engine. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Hi, um, I'm Lori Prado and I, I work with eating disorders and kids. Um, and, and one of the things um, that I'm seeing is a slower processing speed when they're anxious, but then when they're not anxious, they're not having a slower processing speed. So I was wondering if it's that slower processing speed overall or if stuff is getting caught in the emotion region and they're not even getting to the prefrontal cortex to do the decision making. That's a really good question. So kids with anxiety, um, what, what I tend to think of them in, in this context of slow processing speed is that it's a bi-directional kind of thing. Most of the kids that I find with anxiety disorders who have that tendency to slow down when the load kind of gets too much that, um, you know, too much for them to process, making them anxious, is they already have a vulnerability to slow processing speed to begin with. So we look at their cognitive profile, they tend to show, they may even have sort of like average processing speed, but maybe brighter than average kind of kids. Um, but when they get anxious, that vulnerability tends to slow them down. And so what happens is when any of us get anxious, what do we do? We kind of freeze a little bit. We kind of slow down. I mean, there's, that's a normal response because when we get anxious, what do we want to like look at the situation. We want to take time to make sure, okay, why am I anxious? You know, our brain just kind of goes into that mode. So kids who have anxiety disorders who are already vulnerable in that area, they tend to not just freeze, but tend to get completely stuck and to, to um, really slow down. And I do find that those are the kinds of kids who are even more puzzling to treaters and to teachers because they're like, they were fine in this last situation, and now they, they're not even moving. I don't even understand why this happens. One other thing that that kind of reminds me of is that sometimes even kids without anxiety tend to have these sorts of peaks and valleys, and a lot of times it has to do with the task itself. And this is particularly true for kids with anxiety. That means, and what I'm meaning to say is that if they know how to do the task, sometimes they'll just plunge in and do it really well. So I'll hear from parents like, you know, the math homework on Monday, they came home and they did it right away. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, they didn't get it done. It took us four hours to get through a homework worksheet that should have taken us 20 minutes. Very often it's because they knew how to do the homework, again, using the analogy of the drowning person. They knew how to do the homework on Monday. They came in and did it, and they didn't know what to do. So that, those kinds of issues are even more difficult for kids who are anxious because they don't know how to do it. That makes them anxious. It slows them down. They get more anxious, and it becomes this kind of circle. Um, what, what impact does trauma have on, on learning disabled or, or uh, behavior challenges? Um, that's a really good question. And in terms of looking at some of these executive function issues, we don't have a lot of great data, particularly where it relates to some of the things I was talking about. We do know, though, in general, trauma just affects all areas of functioning. 
Um, and it's, it's complicated because some of the research on resiliency shows that sometimes kids, oh, I'm, I'm out of time. All right, I'll finish this question. Um, so this will be the last question. Um, we don't really know that trauma necessarily affects cognition or executive functions. Um, we do know, however, that it can disrupt kids who are already vulnerable in those areas. So again, kind of like what I was talking about with anxiety, if you're already vulnerable, you already don't have great executive function skills, then you have this trauma, the ability that you had to kind of interact with the environment is disrupted. So kids who are come in with great kinds of, again, executive function skills, great language skills, less of um, a chance that they're going to be disrupted by a traumatic experience. Kids who are already vulnerable, much greater chance that that is something that's going to occur. In terms of some of the things that I was talking about, like processing speed, we don't really know, although it just makes sense that it would affect them. I mean, it's something that I think we need to study and, and look at, because I think those are some of our most vulnerable kids. And if you're raised in an anxious environment, just you kind of think that your normal way of interacting with the environment would be to slow down, because you're, you're always concerned about what's going on. So it would make sense. Okay, I'll stop right there. Thanks. Okay.